All right. <clears throat> get turned on. All right. I think we got about to the end of chapter 21. A couple of verses here at the end I want to mention just as we get jump into the next chapter. Verse 33 says, And Abraham plant, planted a grove in Beersheba and called there, uh, called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned in the Philist in the Philistines land many days. I think it's probably of course it's no we know it's down in the Negev at Beersheba. It's getting close to the uh, close to the land uh, uh, that you probably hear about on the news from time to time, Gaza Strip. It's not far from there. And uh, uh, of course that's the it says you're the Philistines. Uh, you could say that Palestinians today, uh, if not if not Physically, at least spiritually, they're, they're the same because they're a thorn in the flesh of Israel just like the Philistines were uh, back, at, back at the time of Abraham. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, I just wanted to show you that as, as Beersheba, that's how it ends up. Uh, Abraham made kind of a, a pact with them to not, uh, uh, about the well that he had dug. And uh, so it says there that he sojourned in the Philistines' land many days we don't know how many days but he was there for quite a while all right well let's go ahead and go over to chapter 22 unless somebody has something to say about uh 21. verse 22 says and after and it came to pass after these things it's interesting to say phrase there after these things that god did tempt abraham and said unto him abraham and he said behold here i am and he said, take now thy son, thy only son, Isaac. All right, well, let's look, look at this. I'm stopping here in the middle of verse 2. But it says it came to pass after, after, after these things, after the, he dealt with the, Pal the Philistines and all the work, workings on it went, where, uh, went there. And then he said, God tempted Abraham. And I, uh, <clears throat> it's not really a... a tempting like we would think. He wasn't tempting him to sin. He was testing him. More, a, a better way of saying that is he was testing him. Let's see what it says here. To try, to prove, or to uh, uh, to, to put him to a test. It's more, more of a, be, a better way to understand what it means here when it says to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, te to uh, in fact, it says a primitive root to test in the, in the meaning of that word. Can't pronounce it. It's a uh, but it's nashal, it uh, looks like is is the way in Hebrew. But it means to uh, uh, it's not tempt, but it's in the sense of tempting to sin. But it's a it's a test in the sense of testing Abraham and testing his faith. You know that, that uh, we're going to see how he tests Abraham's faith. It's a pretty big, a pretty big, uh, a pretty big temptation or t test, I guess you would say. Uh, and Abraham, of what Abraham had to do. And we'll get into that, but I want to look at here. It says, God talked to Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. <clears throat> that, that should be true for all of us when we, when we hear the Lord's voice in our lives, that we should be willing to say, here I am. It reminds me of also the Isaiah, I believe it was, either Isaiah or Ezekiel, I can't remember, uh, that, the, that the Lord put up. Uh, he basically, when the Lord came to him and told him he wanted to prophesy to the people, uh, uh, he said, "Here I." After, after it was all over and done with, he said, "Here I am." He said the same phrase, uh, "Here I am, send me." After the Lord had uh, had purified him, uh, no, but the long story short, he purified him, but but the taking the coal and putting it on his tongue uh, to purify him. But he said, uh, "Here I am." But anyhow, uh, I, I, Abraham says, "says all right." He's basically saying, "I don't know if Abraham knew at this point that he was he was going to be tested. I think maybe he did, but he didn't know how yet." And 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 he said, "All right, put me to the test." Another way, another way of looking at what he's saying, uh, "Put me to the test, Lord." But then he says in verse two, and this is this was uh, the instructions for what he gives him to test him with, and we've mentioned it a, a time or two. Uh, over the over the past few few months, when we started in Genesis, 
Uh, but we're going to look at it where, uh, in, the, in the scripture how it takes place. It says, and, and he said, let's talk about the Lord, take thy son, thy only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. Again, look, it says, is that, the, is that Isaac's only son? He had Ishmael also, right? But God is, looks at, at, at Isaac as being his only son. Very similar to what it, when we talk about Jesus as being the only begotten son. Now, there are a lot of, once we are saved, we are sons and daughters of God, according to Scripture. And, and uh, also, a lot of times, uh, angels were referred to as sons of God uh, in the Scripture. We looked at that back in chapter 6 of Genesis. But, but here he says, he's saying Isaac is his only son, whom thou lovest. So there was obviously a better bond between uh, Isaac and Abraham than Ishmael and Abraham. And uh, he, says, he says, take him, take whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. All right, <clears throat> he's he's telling telling uh, Abraham to take Isaac, the only son, the son of promise. He's the son that God promised to him. Remember, and God fulfilled that promise. And now God's telling the, telling him to take him and sacrifice him on the altar. Uh, and I will talk about the location in a minute. But he's tell, telling him to go and sacrifice him. To, uh, to him. Now, you're going to see little hints as we go through this, this particular uh, setting, a particular thing about Abraham offering up Isaac. We're going to get little hints about what Abraham's, uh, uh, what Abraham believes. Uh, I think Abraham believes that, that he would be resurrected, he would be brought back to life if he, he, if he sacrificed it. I'm kind of letting the cat out of the bag there, but you're going to see it. Uh, but there's little hints all in, through this as we go through it about what Abraham's attitude was of it. But can you imagine what Abraham felt when he was a, when he was told to take the only son, his only son, even though he wasn't his only son, but he was his only begotten son, you might say. He was the son of God's promise uh, that God gave him. He was the son of the Spirit rather than than the son of the flesh. Uh, he's, uh, he's the one that Abraham loved, most, uh, most importantly. Now, you're going to see a little bit of that, too, as we get over into Jacob, the, about favorites. Because Jacob did have favorites if he had 12 sons. But, but this is a favorite. This is a favorite here. Uh, Isaac is a favorite of Abraham. And it's because it's, he's the fa favorite because, again, uh, he's the one that God promised him. Now, if look at it from Abraham's point. God promised him, if you were Abraham, God, God would promise you a son. And, and, you, and he fulfills that thing. He's given you a son. And now God asks you, and he says that through him is going to be hundreds of uh, uh, many nations will be born through, through this son. And yet God is telling you now to go and sacrifice him. You see, this attitude that Abraham has to have is somehow this has got to take place. Even though I don't understand it, even though I don't, I can't conceive of how it would take place, this has got to be uh, the son of promise. This has got to be the child that, uh, set that the, the, the promise comes through. And we're going to look at, we're going to see little promises also as we go along. But he says, Whom thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah. Now I'm talking about the land of Moriah. Uh, the land of Moriah, Moriah is basically a ridge of mountains. And the, if, if, uh, uh, if you ask a Jew where the land of Moriah is, you're going to, if you're in Jerusalem, he's going to point to the Temple Mount. That's, the, that's Moriah. It's one. It says here, offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And I think that's the, the Temple Mount, because that's the that's the mountain range of Moriah. It's on that mountain range. So 
so God is telling uh, uh, Abraham to take Isaac to the location where today is known as the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Same place. Uh, that's where uh, that's where he's heading to. And God is is and and also you keep in mind that's what that's the in that mountain range and very similar to that, or very close to it, if you will, is where Jesus was crucified. Uh, they they in that mountain range. In other words, Jesus was sacrificed in the same place that Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him. Same place. Okay? That's where Jesus was, was crucified. And and so keep that in mind that the land of Marah uh, runs is a mountain range and one of the mountains in that mountain range is the Temple Mount, the, the mountain. Uh, now there's higher mountains around there, the Mount of Olives, which is across the Kidron Valley from Mount Moriah where, where uh, the temple is at, is higher. In other words, if you stand on, on the Mount of Olives, you actually look down to see Mount Moriah and where the temple mount's at. And so that's where Jesus will return to, by the way. When he returns, it, say, it says his feet will land on the Mount of Olives. They will touch down the same place that Jesus ascended to heaven from. It's where he's going to come back to, yeah, or the Mount of Olives. And, it's, and that's where, he, from there, he will enter into Jerusalem, not on the back of a donkey this time, but as a conqueror, conqueror uh, on, on a white horse, according to Scripture. But anyhow, the burnt off he's asking him to give him to offer Isaac as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And I'm sure that that mountain, the one that he's going to tell him of, is going to be uh, where the Temple Mount or the Temple Mount area is at. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. The indication there is that he didn't waste no time. Uh, he saddled his ass or his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood for a burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him of. A couple things I want to point out here. He rose up early in the morning uh, and, and got on uh, and got his donkey uh, <clears throat> took his took two men with him uh, I think that that a couple of different things, a couple of things about the two men. Uh, when Jesus was crucified, what was he crucified between? Two men. Uh, this, uh, uh, these two men are also, another thing about them, I think they are witnesses. Uh, that that there needs to be a witness to what's going on. And these two men were that witness. <coughs> Uh, there's a lot of interesting little things in this in this passage uh, that points toward uh, Jesus, and uh, I'll show you another one. And here you see he he says, "And Isaac his son, he took so he took Isaac his son with him, and uh, and he says, and he clave the wood burnt offering. In other words, he's carrying wood. What did Jesus do? But but where he's from? Just as, just as they, they're taking this bundle of wood up to Mount Moriah, uh, it's, a point, it's pointing, I believe, toward Jesus carrying the cross up onto Mount Moriah or up on Mount of Olives, however you want to put it. And he says, And clave the wood and burnt offerings and rose up and went into the place which God had told him of. So God is leading them there. Then on the third day, Three days again. Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. So they traveled for three days. Uh, after it says, then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. So after three days, he sees the location. I think that's interesting. How, how many days was Jesus in the tomb? Three days. Yeah, and and also I think it the, this points points toward that as well. It's interesting how God uses numbers, too, also. Then Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now look what Abraham is saying here. Look closely at what he's saying. 
He says, you stay, you two guys, you stay here, abide here with the ass, with the donkey, uh, kind of as witnesses, you might say, and I, and I, and the lad, and of course, I, I, Isaac here probably was a, at least a teenager, and maybe some believe he was up up into the age near the age that Jesus was, up to th maybe in his 30, early 30s. We don't know. But he says, I, will, I and the young lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. What's he saying? I and the lad will go worship and I will come again to you. And you see what I, I, Abraham is saying here? He says, we're both going to go up there and we're both going to come back. You want to say it? Even though he's no going, knows that he's going up there to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, that he knows that somehow God is going to allow him to bring Isaac back. And so I believe here, it's a, that is a word, that is a, 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 a phrase of faith, a, a, a powerful phrase of faith, when he says, I and the lad will go up there, and I and the lad basically will come back, even though he's going to go up there to sacrifice him. I have always wondered: did did, did Isaac know what was going to be, take place? Uh, some people, you never you never really get an indication of whether he knew it. But let's look on, and maybe we'll get kind of a, a, a inkling of what I believe is going on. Then Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the wood and laid it upon Isaac. What did they do to Jesus? They made him carry his own cross. Again, a symbol of what I think is what's taking place. He took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. So they took the fire. A fire is an indication of, uh, of uh, judgment. Of course, a knife is the instrument of sacrifice. And he says that he's going to go up there, and he's, he's taking the fire, everything he needs. Of course, you know they didn't have matches, so he had to take fire. Either they had to get up there and start trying to create a fire. It's easier for him to just take the fire with him. And they went both of them together up onto this specific mountain. And I think it's probably the same mountain, Mount Moriah, the same place where the Temple Mount is located, where hundreds later on, there would be hundreds and thousands of sheep sacrificed and goats and, and uh, 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 bullocks and uh, uh, all, all kind of different sacrifices would take place at that same location. But this is the first one. It says, And Isaac spake to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? So now Isaac, you're getting an idea. Isaac didn't understand here at this point that he was going to be the sacrifice. But he said to his father, We've got everything we need. Uh, he's asking his father, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Remember what John the Baptist called Jesus. He said, behold, the lamb of God. Jesus was that lamb. This is a picture, a beautiful picture in the Old Testament of what all took place when Jesus was crucified. Uh, it just... Bible, Back to that, back to that same, that same scripture. It's the same thing. It, I, I, what what Isaac and what Abraham and Isaac are doing here, God is picturing the sacrifice that Jesus would do. Uh, probably a thousand, close to a thousand years later. <clears throat> Any other comments? All right, now let's look at Abraham's response to Isaac. When Isaac asked, asked him, where's the, where's the sacrifice? 
And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Abraham said, and I look closely at what Abraham said. Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for burnt offering. You see what I'm saying? I think it's it's almost as though God is saying, he is going to be. He is going to be. He is going to become the sacrifice himself. God put on human flesh when he became when he and came to the earth uh, in in flesh in his as his son Jesus. He provided his own himself to be the sacrifice for us. You see what how how the play of words here uh, works. Abraham, Moses, I mean not Moses. Abraham is saying God will provide, quote, Himself as a sacrifice. You could say it like that. I don't like to change the words of the scripture, but it says, but provide a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So they continued to go up there together. And this is a picture of God. Abraham is the picture of God, and Isaac is a picture of the Son Jesus, as they go up to the mountain. The Father and the Son. And they came to the place which God had told him of, which would be most likely the top of Mount Moriah, which today, if you look at a picture of of the Temple Mount, is under that golden dome. That's where it's at. If you see that golden dome, that's where that place is at, which God told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac. Jesus was bound. Unless he lays the wood in order, has a certain way that it lays the wood, and he binds in the wood and he and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. What did you what did the, what did the Romans do to Jesus? They had him bound. They probably bound his arms to the cross and then they nailed him to the cross. On the wood, just like it says here bound him on the wood upon the altar. The altar would be uh, uh, would be where, uh, where Jesus was crucified. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took a knife to slay his son. He was going to kill, he was going to kill him because he, I personally and, and the indication here is that he believed that Isaac was going to be resurrected, that God was going to bring him back to life somehow, some way because they both were supposed to come back down. And we're going to see a, a real interest in what interest in takes place later on as we continue reading the, through this. Abraham stretched forth his son and took his knife to slay his son. He says, and, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Same words that he said earlier. The angel of the Lord. And he said, Lay not thy thy hand upon the lad, neither do thou do anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, and seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. Says the angel of the Lord, that's the Lord. I believe that's Jesus, basically, that appeared unto him and and tells him not to lay his hand upon the lad. Now, if, I, if I'm right, and that's Jesus. Jesus knows that he's going to do that. He knows that he eventually is going to be that lamb that, that Isaac is a picture of here. But he says, don't, don't lay up your hand upon thy son, uh, for, for I know thou know that thou hath fearest God, and seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. What he's saying is, is also that he knows that now, do you think that God knew what Abraham would do beforehand? I do. I believe he knew. But it was a test. It was a test, not as much as God wanted to know know what he would do, but it was a test for, for Abraham, for Abraham to realize what's going to take place. Plus, it's also a prophetic picture, just like we've been talking so far, that it's a, a prophetic picture of what God would do through Abraham and Isaac uh, as a picture of what would happen between God and his son on Mount Moriah about a thousand years later. 
uh, he says, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, he's willing to give up his only son. That's what God did. He gave up his only begotten son. Now, how many of us put ourselves in Abraham's place? How many of us could do that? Those, especially those of us that have had children. See that the attitude that Abraham had to have? He had to believe that he would be resurrected. But also, that shows of what God went through when he did offer his son. That's why it turned dark. Uh, and, and God closed closed off the light when Jesus was all, was uh, sacrificed on the cross. And of course, there was the, the earthquake also that took place. But anyhow, it says, I, you've not withheld your only son. Abraham passed the test, and God shows him that he passed the test. And, and, and again, that's a <laughs> tremendous test for Abraham to have to go through. But he trusted God, he believed God, and God accounted it for him as righteousness. People ask, how do people in the Old Testament get saved? The same way that people in the New Testament get saved. They have to have faith. Abraham had faith in God's word. Abraham had faith that God would do what he said he would do. And we as Christians, what do we have to, what, are, what is our faith in? We have faith that God will do what he said he would do give us eternal life that we would pass from death into life just like Isaac would pass from death into life because had God not stopped Ab Abraham Abraham would have killed his only son they, so, Ab so Isaac passed from death into life just like we are to pass from death into life uh, we as Christians when we accept Jesus as our Savior we die of course, we're already dead in our trespasses and sin, but we die with him on the cross. And, and then when, when Jesus was buried, we are buried with him. And we don't really understand that concept and, and grasp it as, as we should. And then after we are buried with him, we are resurrected. When Jesus was resurrected on the third day, we are resurrected with him. And we're resurrected into a new life. You might say Isaac received a new life here because he was going to be, he was going to die. And yet he, he got a new life, a new beginning. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So God provided a, a sacrifice for Abraham just like God provided a sacrifice for us. Yet, it's much more than a, than a ram. By the way, uh, just as a little side note here, though, it, you notice, um, I'm, I'm going to change. Let me get back where I was at. I hit the wrong button and it changed chapters on me. Uh, See, we've got to verse, verse 13. And Abraham lifted up his eye, yeah, and, and looked, and he found a, a, a ram. It was caught, but it, notice how it says it was caught in the thicket by his horns. That is the, that's where the Jews get the, I guess, a tradition. I don't know if it would really be a tradition, but they use uh, the shofar, the blowing of the trumpet. That's, the, that's where they get that. The, the first horn, you might say, was was uh, on that is in, indicated by this this ram that was caught by in, by in the thicket by his horns. Now, Jesus also, uh, you don't know what kind of thicket it was, but also it's an indication possibly, and I might be reading too much into this, but indication also that just as Jesus' head was was covered with a, a thicket of thorns. This ram was caught by his horns in the thicket. In other words, his possibly the the ram's head possibly was bloody from maybe just like Jesus would have was, was. But anyhow, the horn is an indication that's where they get the shofar, the blowing of the trumpet. Uh, they the Jews use the ram's horn still today. You can buy them. I've got two or three of them, and uh, you can still buy them uh, uh, ram's horns. Uh, 
Uh, but anyhow, Abraham called the name of the of this place, that place, Jehovah Yara, and it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen, and that that's interesting that he says that in the mountain of the Lord it shall be seen. It was in the mountain of the Lord. We uh, we some some of you ladies, some of you guys may have a a, a necklace on with a cross on it. You know, that's having a necklace with a cross on it would be crazy if you lived prior to uh, Jesus' crucifixion because that would be like us have, wearing a necklace with a with a, an electric chair on it. It's a thing of execution. And yet we wear it as a as a symbol of God's new life that he's provided through through the through the cross. And so it says, and he said, the name of Je Jehovah Yireh. And I think if I'm not mistaken, that means God will provide. Jehovah will see. Uh, I'm looking at the, the meaning of that word. This Jehovah Yireh, named for the Mount of Moriah. And it basically, you don't say here a whole lot about what symbolical name of Mount Moriah. <coughs> Jehovah will see. Uh, is the, the actual meaning of it, and that says that Jehovah will see. And Jehovah Yireh became and it became known as the Mount Moriah. But anyhow, uh, that's what what is what take, takes place here. And the angel and the Lord called unto Abraham out of the heaven and the second time and said, By myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for for because thou hast done this thing. And it's not withheld thy son, thy only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand of the sand which is upon the seashore, and as <clears throat> and thy seed shall shall possess the gate of his enemies. Now look at that, let's look at that again. That the that the blessing that he will bless you because you, Abraham, because you've not withheld your only son uh, and, and, not, and, and offered him up, even though he didn't, he wasn't put to death. Because you've done that, it says, I will bless the, uh, thy seed as, as the stars of heaven. Now, we've, now we've read it three times. God uh, compares his, Abraham's descendants. First, as the, as the, uh, as the, the sands of the sea, the dust of the earth, and now it's the stars of heaven. Three different categories. Uh, we've seen all three of them through this so far through this uh, this book. I believe the dust of the earth are, are the are the are the Arabs, all the descendants of Abraham through through Ishmael. The the, the sands of the sea, I believe, are the, the children of Abraham, the ones that are born through Isaac, the physical descendants of Isaac, the Jews, if you will. And the stars of heaven. Who is that? According to this, the stars of heaven, because because of God, the faith that Abraham showed, that his descendants will be as the stars of heaven. How are we saved? By faith, we believe God, and He trusts and He accounts it as righteousness, and that's how we become sons of Abraham. We become sons of Abraham not by blood, not by lineage, but by faith that we become children of Abraham. And so, so we are the stars, the stars of heaven. You've got three different groups there, the Arabs, the Jews, and the church, if you will. I I'd rather call it the, the descendants uh, uh, or the, uh, the Christians. But that's, that's where I think you see that upon the, he, he compares it to the sands of the sea, uh, here again, he's already done compared it to the sands of the sea, which I believe is the Jews, but then he also compares it to the stars of heaven. And he says, Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. Again, that word is not plural, it's don't, it don't say which, and thy seeds shall possess it. Don't say that, it says, and thy seed shall possess the gate. I think that's the indication that that. The descendant of there will be a descendant of Abraham 
that will sit upon the throne uh, and rule the world. Uh, basically, he will control. He will sit in the gate. In other, in other words, that means that means that uh, he will he will judge who comes in and goes out. Now, you can understand a gate of a city in Jesus's time. Uh, we've seen those of you that have been to, to Israel, you probably remember the guy teaching us about the gate is the most important place in the city. There's there's rooms on the gate. As you go as you go through the gate, there's rooms on on the inside and rooms on the outside, and in, in them stands people with bows and arrows. And and uh, and, the, and the leader and the 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 uh, the uh, head person of the city, the mayor, you might say, however you want to look at it, he would sit in the middle of the gate and he would judge who got to come in and bring their goods in or whatever and who would not get to come. And if he said, take care of these guys, they would shoot them with arrows. Or he would say, come on in, and they would, they would pass by uh, going into the gate. And so that what this says here is, thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. In other words, he will judge who comes in and who don't come in. He will be the one that will he will be the one that will uh, say yes or no. Jesus, remember, you remember Jesus talks about uh, 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 the judgment to where he brings the sheep and the goats, and he says, "You you did this, that, or the other, and well, good, not coming coming in there into your kingdom." And the other ones, he said, "You didn't visit me. You didn't give me water. You didn't get." He says. You, you you don't get to come in. Basically, it's the same thing. That's what Jesus is doing in that particular time when Jesus said that uh, uh, he would make a judgment. That's what this is. The, the what is it? What's it called? The judgment seat of Christ. Some people refer to it as that. But that's what he says here. His seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. It's talking about Jesus. And in thy seed. Shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice? Now Abraham, why is it? But why is he? Why is is uh, is his seed going to bless the nations? Because Abraham obeyed God's voice. Abraham did what God asked him to do. Abraham believed by faith to trust the Lord to the point that he was willing to offer his only son, and that's exactly what God did. He offered his only son, and because of that, we become the children of Abraham, the sons of God, if you will. We've got a little bit of time yet. I think if I'm reading that right. No, it's about time. Now, I'm going to, excuse me, go ahead. The gate of Jerusalem there at that little spot there you talk about Mount Moriah. Mm-hmm. Is that where Jesus was crucified? Is that where the skull it's like in the mount right there. It's well, same spot. that's that's on that is it's controversial <laughs> where it actually took place. The Catholics believe it's at the church of uh, I can't remember what the name of the church is, which is outside the gate, outside the wall at that time. And uh, of course, I tend to believe that it's very possible that it was that it was uh, at the garden tomb. Is where you would sacrifice it, of where you see the good skull and all that kind of stuff. They don't. We don't really know. You can't really. The, the Catholics they they hold very Church of the Holy Sepulcher is what they call it. Uh, you've been there. I think you went, went into that church. Uh, but then there's a the garden tomb, and there's a people that believe that somewhere it was very possible it's somewhere else. We don't know. Uh, I tend to tend to believe there's a lot of good evidence that it was at. Uh, the garden too. But uh Are you talking about when you go to the Joppa Gate, you basically turn left, there's a church there and they believe you just crucified and buried. And it looks like when you literally when you walk in it looks like there's a mountain inside like this room. Is that what you're talking about? You talk when you when you walk out of the No, when I was there I went into the Joppa Gate? Yeah, went into the Joppa Gate. I turned basically left and when you go into this church, I'll use that term loosely. There is a marble slab there that they plant. Yeah, now that's the holy. That's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah. And then on the right, there looks like a little Columbia Mountain, and there, and they claim that it was buried in one of these holes in that mountain. Mm -hmm. okay. right. It don't really look like a mountain, though. It looks no, more like, it looks a, like a 
big pile of dirt. Yes. <laughs> uh, but but that, there's, there's no way of knowing for sure. Uh, one of our guides, which was a Jew, the first, about the first time I went, he 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 believed that if it did, it did take place, of course he wasn't a Christian, he wasn't a Messianic Jew. Uh, but he took us down under it and showed us where the crack, you know, that supposedly was the crack where the cross was at and so forth. Again, you don't know. Uh, you can't prove it. Though there's some that says that that can. But. So if that was true, then the word was crucified and where he was supposed to bury right there close to each other. Yeah. Right there. But, uh, but what I was going to say that we, on this next verse is, so Abraham returned to to <clears throat> To his young, so Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. What's, what's, what's strange about that verse? Let me read it again. And Abraham returned unto his young men, of the two witnesses, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt with, at Beersheba. Huh? Isaac is not with him. Isaac, I believe, was with him. They just don't say it. And that's what you're going to find is that the word Isaac does not appear anymore until Isaac gets a wife and he receives his wife. When God Abraham, God, Abraham sends, uh, we're up getting way ahead, but Abraham sends his servant to go get a wife. And when he comes, the next time the word Isaac is mentioned is when that wife comes and he sees his wife. I think that's very, very, very interesting. Why is it that Isaac's name is not mentioned at all? Why is the Holy Spirit took Isaac's name out of that period of time? That's the church age. When, this, when Jesus would not be gone, would not be dwelling with men. That period of time represents, I believe, the time we're in today when Jesus is not with us. And, when, and, it, and, it, and his name then returns when he receives his bride. And what's going to happen? When Jesus comes and receives his bride, then Jesus will dwell with man again. But you're going to notice it. Well, I'm going to point it out that you don't see Isaac's name in Scripture anymore until... <clears throat> until he receives his bride. So here you see a play on words that's throughout the scripture, especially here's one of the best examples of it in scripture that you have. Uh, that I believe Isaac was with Abraham. Isaac did go home with Abraham to Beersheba. Isaac did do all the things. He was his son, but the Holy Spirit just left that name out of the, of the scripture, just took it out. Just didn't let... Abraham, whoever, well, Moses, when Moses wrote it, he didn't put Isaac's name in there anymore. And that's the next, last time you'll see Isaac until he gets his bride. Any, any comments in mind like that? Let's all stand. We'll be dismissed because we're probably a little bit over. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator and maker of this universe, we just praise your name for your, for your word that you have written to us by your Holy Spirit. And Father, we just thank you that, uh, that we can see how your, your plan all along was to redeem us through the work of your Son and to provide us a lamb that would take away our sin. And we just praise you, Father, for, for allowing us to become made as stars of the heaven, Father, in your kingdom as your, as your adopted sons and daughters. Father, we do pray that you'll be with all those on our prayer list, to be with each one that, uh, uh, that is here today, bring with our, be with our pastor as he brings a message, and God direct us in the days ahead. I pray now a blessing over everyone here. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. As always, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. 
and Shem Yeshua. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to have you all today. Thank you.